Awesome. Well, open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6, where I, I kind of said before that we were wrapping up our Secret Place series, but psych, we're not. We're going to keep going a little bit longer. Um, so we talked about the three realities of the Secret Place. We talked about prayer, we talked about fasting, we talked about giving. And another one that's mixed in there throughout Matthew chapter 5 and 7 is not just giving, but forgiving. That forgiveness is a huge reality that really God's mercy, it takes God's mercy and God's grace and us experiencing that and His forgiveness. Right? Knowing that we've been forgiven much, so we're going to love much. He's shown us grace and mercy, so we're going to give that away. And that is something that needs to be a defining characteristic of the end time church because what's going to happen, the Bible talks about it in Matthew 24 where Jesus tells his disciples that there's going to be a culture of betrayal. There's going to be lawlessness and, and most people, it actually says most people's love will grow cold. And you'll be hated even by all nations for my namesake. So in the midst of betrayal and hatred and division, God's going to have a counterculture rise up of those that know how to forgive and show compassion and mercy in the same way that he's shown it to us. Like That's going to be the beacon. That's going to be the light that's going to shine is mercy being poured out through us. And so unforgiveness, we know, is a tactic, a scheme of the enemy. If, if we have anger and unforgiveness in our heart, then it puts up barriers, it puts up walls, it affects us in our emotions, it affects us spiritually. We end up being uh, held captive because of uh, this filter where everything's coming through this wound, everything's coming through what this person said or did or didn't say or didn't do. And so there's that spirit of rejection, that, that abandonment that we feel, that it's like, well, how can God be a good father? All these different distortions that can happen that the enemy uses to keep us from being that unified family, that unified body. Because he knows that Jesus prayed. You don't think the devil was listening when Jesus was praying? Yes, he was. Did the devil quote to Jesus' scripture? Yes, he did. What did Jesus say in John 17? That my desire is that they would be one. As you and I are one, Father. And so the enemy's like, I've got to stop them from being one. I've got to create whatever offense and bitterness. I've got to get them to turn against each other. That's his whole thing. If I can do that, they'll never become one. And the world won't know that the Father sent the Son. I mean, that's a, one way that the enemy's saying, I can thwart the plan of God by planting seeds of discord and distrust right there in the family. And, you know, you've heard me talk about the wheat and the tares a lot. Jesus told that parable where it's, a, it's about the harvest at the end of the age. Right? And it's interesting that the, the wheat is there, right? And the enemy comes in and sows the tares amidst the wheat. So it's not just that there's good and evil, right? It's, it's not just that the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light, all of this is going to mature and come to a head at the end of the age. But even in the midst of the wheat, there's going to be wolves in sheep's clothing. Jesus said there's going to be many false Christs and many false prophets, right? God's, God's going to have an answer for that. And so we're going to look at Matthew in the Sermon on the Mount where he mentions this uh, quite a few times. And hopefully it will encourage us and strengthen us and our spirit man to be able to walk this way even in the midst of this culture of betrayal and hatred and division. So Matthew chapter 6, we're going to look at verse 12. So this is actually picking up in the middle. The disciples uh, asking the Lord to teach them how to pray, and he gives them the Lord's Prayer here. And in the middle of it, in verse 12, he's, and he's saying this, you should pray like this, Forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. So it's right there in this essential context of Jesus teaching his disciples to pray that forgiveness is critical to your spiritual life, to your prayer life. Forgive us our debts because you've forgiven us of our debts. So if you've freely released us, we have to freely release other people as well. Then you skip down to verse 14. Jesus follows it up 
with for if you forgive other people for their offenses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive other people, then your Father will not forgive your offenses. That's pretty, that's pretty direct, isn't it? Pretty clear that you have freely received and you have to freely give now. And Jesus would tell the parable, you guys know it as well, where there was a servant that owed the king lots and lots of money, a debt that he could never pay. You know, millions and millions of dollars, essentially. And the king calls him forward and says, you know what? I'm going to forgive you that massive debt. It's all good. It's cleared away. Go in peace, right? You're free of that weight. You don't have to worry, carry that burden anymore. You owe me nothing. I'm going to have mercy on you right now. And then that servant goes out and finds some people that work for him, and he demands that they pay him. He says, hey, it's time to pay up, Right? Instead of sharing that same mercy with them, instead of the way that he received mercy, he goes and, and tries to wring their necks, basically, and demand that they pay up. And so we know what happens is the king finds out that his servant is doing this and calls him back and said, how could you do this? I forgave you this massive debt that you could never repay. And then you go and treat other people that way. Shouldn't be so. So now... I'm going to reverse this whole thing. You're going to be locked up and say you can pay this debt. So Jesus told this parable to say, man, you've got to forgive. And forgive, Peter would say, well, how many times do I need to forgive? Seven times 77, right? Like forgive and keep on forgiving. Again and again and again. So this is no small issue to the Lord. It's very important to him. And like I said, for us as well. Now here's the thing. I want to say this. I want to say it really clear. Because we've surrendered our lives and put our trust in Jesus, and if you haven't, I hope you do that today, but because we've done that, we've been forgiven of our sins, right? Past, present, and future. Thank the Lord, it's under the blood, right? It's been wiped away in the sea of forgetfulness. As far as the east is from the west, so far as He's taken our sins from us, right? What a gift. And let me say this, that every single one of those sins were against God. For real, they're all against God. And that's why people think, well, how could, you know, hell be created? How could God send people to hell? And of course, God doesn't send people to hell. People get to make a choice. And He's going to respect their will. They have a free will. And if they decide to reject His offer of love, mercy, and forgiveness, then they can have the alternative to that. And hell was not created for human beings, but for Satan and the fallen angels. But if you decide to reject Jesus and his lordship, then guess who your Lord and your Father is? It's Satan. You get to have the same faith that he gets in your pride and in your whatever else to reject that free gift. That's the reality. Well, once again, mercy and God's mercy, because people will say, oh, that sin didn't hurt really that bad, didn't hurt anybody, there wasn't any victim in this and that. But the whole point is, is that forever that sin is against God because God lives forever. And God has a, a really big brain and a really good memory. Okay, it's, it's, that, it's not that God forgets, it's that he chooses to not remember our sins. You hear me? You hear what I'm saying? So if, if our sins are eternally against God, what would it be like to feel a person's sin against you? Multiple sins for an entire lifetime, generations after generations. Do you don't think that God has that reality? And so God shouldn't punish people. I'm telling you, those sins are there forever except for the blood of Jesus removing them. We don't, we don't think eternally. We don't think big enough. And so we think, well, God's being unjust or unkind or he's being unfair somehow. No, he's not. He's an eternal being who actually feels Right? Who actually knows our sin, our thoughts, our emotions, and connects with that in a deep way forever. And thus the atoning blood of Jesus coming to create peace, to remove that wall that was there, to reconcile us to God. But I'm just trying to paint you a picture that the fact is, is that we deserved hell, yet God gave us mercy through Jesus Christ. And what did Jesus do on the cross? He took our punishment. He paid our debt in full. He removed the curse of the law. And he restored our relationship to the Father. That atoning, substitutionary sacrifice on the cross. That's what it bought and paid for. 
And here's the thing. This is, this is what's mind-boggling. We can never get away from this truth. That he did all of that while we were far away. We were far off enemies, not even thinking about him, not concerned at all with his love or his grace or his mercy. We were living, like the Bible said in Ephesians that I read to you earlier, according to the lusts of our flesh as sons of disobedience. And yet God did all of that for us to enable us to express love, to show mercy, and to forgive others. That's the thing. What a gift we've been given. What blessings. What an amazing Father we have that we have that inheritance with Him. We have this position with Him. He did it for us, but, but to enable us to go and do the same. That's the thing. To express love, show mercy, and to forgive others. So we have freely received. How can we not freely give? That's the question. And that's the parable that Jesus just told. You freely receive, servant. How can you not freely give in the same way that you received? So God did not withhold from us, right? And Paul says this in one of his letters, I believe, to the Corinthians, that he didn't withhold his own son. How will he not give you all things, right? That's the question. God did not withhold from us, so we shouldn't withhold from others. And if we do withhold from others and we harbor unforgiveness and offense and bitterness and everything else, hold that grudge and we want to get even and all of that, all it does is ends up hindering our own emotional health and spiritual growth. Period. That's all it does. You need to think about that for a second. If we withhold mercy and forgiveness from others, we end up hindering our own emotional health and spiritual growth. Remember, I said this before, those who have been forgiven much, they what? Love much. Why is that? Have you, thought, have you ever thought about that? Have you ever connected the dots? It's because when you've been forgiven much, you overflow with this love because of the depth of your understanding and the gratitude that you have for how Christ has poured out his grace and compassion on you. See, some of us maybe don't understand the gap that was there. Some of us don't understand the distance between us and God and how holy and how other than He is as compared to us. He's uncreated. He's pure and perfect in every sense. And when He humbled Himself, became a man, and you've been touched by that love and that forgiveness and that mercy, I mean, you're forever changed. You can't help but say, okay, I was a knothead. I was doing all of this stuff with my pride and my everything in my world was for me and me alone. I was selfish and, and, and that was it. I was wrapped up in that. And I argued, you know, with you. I, I, I strayed off the path. I heard some truths and yet still I wandered away. Like, I know my journey. I, I know how messed up I am without the grace of God. And that gives me gratitude. That gives me thankfulness. That gives me an understanding of how much I need Him and how well He treated me. How can I treat others poorly? If I know what He's done for me, the depths to which He's brought me out of, and the heights to which He's taken me, I've been seen with Him, how can I not want the best for other people? How can I not see the good in them? And want to pray and prophesy and see that fruit come forth. How can we not? So you go on now to Matthew chapter 7. And he talks about it again. Look at verse 1. Do not judge so that you will not be judged. Now this is critical for in the way you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. <laughs> then you skip down to verse 12. That's verse 1 and 2 of Matthew 7. Verse 12 says, In everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you, for this is the law and the prophets. There we have the golden rule, don't we? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. You know, in other religions and other worldviews and belief systems, their idea is similar to this. But it's the reverse of that. Don't do to somebody else what you wouldn't want them to do to you. And that, that sounds fine and all, but that's just passive. Like, I just, I just won't do anything. I'll just kind of go away and avoid people. and I won't do it to them, and hopefully they won't do it to me. 
Whereas in Christ, it's active. It's like, no, I want to do for people. I want to serve. I want to show mercy. I want to do justice. I want to love in tangible ways, in real ways. I don't want to just die to kind of do my own thing and good luck to the rest of the world. No. I want to be salt and light. I want to put action the way that Christ came out of heaven, right? He took action. That's the thing. That's the difference between Christianity and every other worldview. It's pretty interesting, isn't it? And Jesus said, if you treat people this way, this is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. The Ten Commandments are a piece of cake, right? When you're focused on love, loving God, and then out of that place, out of the overflow, loving other people. See, when it's not about you anymore, wait a second, when it's not all wrapped up about you and everything else, and it's about pouring out into others, it's pretty hard to disobey and rebel against God. It's a lot easier to follow Jesus when you're consumed with his love and pouring it out on other people. But if it's about you all the time, it's real easy to get off track. Hear, hear me now. I'm trying to be as nice as possible. But is that not the human experience? It's so easy for us to get so concerned with ourselves that will do all sorts of things to try to figure things out and fix it. And once again, play the blame game that I'm here because of this person in that situation, or God didn't do this, or whatever it is. Woe is me. And you get into this state where the enemy can use that. He can use that negative emotion and start to whisper, you know, bring accusation against God and other people. And then all of a sudden, you can't, you can't see the goodness of God. You can't see... What, what others are trying to do because you're so blinded by your own self. Okay. You get it, I think. But this whole idea of, of do not judge, you will be judged to the measure that you... And he's not saying that we're not to make judgment calls. We have to make judgment calls. I like, who am I going to hang out with? There's certain groups of people I shouldn't be hanging out with. And I'm making a judgment call to say, no, that's not good. I'll hang out with these people. I'm not going to go to that place because I know what happens there. I'm going to stay in this place. right? You have to make judgment calls. But what he's saying is the way that you judge, the way that you interact with people in their failings and shortcomings and in their lives, judge with mercy and compassion. Not with condescension. right? Not with superiority. Not with, you know... I've been hurt by this person, so I'm just going to write them off. Or they continue to fall in the same sin, so it's just a waste of time. You see what I'm saying? You can't judge like that. You've got to see people the way that God sees people. And when he looks at people, he sees them lost and broken and wants to have compassion on them. And treat them with mercy and grace that probably, of course, none of us deserve. We don't deserve it. It wouldn't be mercy and grace if we deserved it. It's unmerited. And in our human frame, it's hard to give unmerited favor and love and mercy to people. It just is. <laughs> so, does that make sense to you? Because people will take that sometimes and just run crazy with the whole judge thing. But yes, the other thing is that sometimes, you know, there's an area where we're really good. We're really good at this particular path of righteousness. This is not a area of sin for us. We don't have that addiction. We don't have this, you know, jealousy issue or whatever it is. And so when we don't have that and someone else does, we're real quick, right, to be like, you need to deal with that. I don't have jealousy. I don't, or whatever it is. That becomes a big thing because it's, we, we've got it under control. We've got it figured out. Why don't they? You see what I'm saying? We start to judge them based on, well, I'm good in this area. How come you're not? You see what I'm saying? And then we minimize the things that we <laughs> end up airing in. You know, well, I've got a little bit of an anger problem, but it only happens in, or whatever. Right? We start to justify and minimize. I'm not as angry as that person, or whatever. Compare yourself to whoever. And this is where we enter into that critical spirit of judgment. That's what Jesus is talking about. Don't judge like that. Because he's basically saying, by the standard you measure, and here's the thing he also would say, in how you show mercy, 
right? It's what he says in the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. So he's saying, hey, the, the, the measure that you show mercy is the measure of mercy that you're going to receive. I mean, he pretty much says that. Think about this. There's a pattern emerging here. Jesus really cares about how we interact with each other. He really does. So much so that he treats us in many ways according to how we treat other people. To the standard, and we just read it, of measure that you judge, so you'll be judged. To the standard of measure that you give mercy, so you will receive mercy. This is why the Bible says in the book of James that mercy triumphs over judgment. And we like to think about that, that we just kind of get a free pass, and God's going to be nice and kind of wink at our sin and go on, and we're not going to have to go through any suffering, and mercy's going to triumph over judgment. The reason that mercy triumphs over judgment is because we've chosen to show mercy instead of to hand out judgment to people. That's why mercy wins, because we let it win in our lives towards other people. You see what I'm saying? Mercy will triumph over judgment because we chose not to act in judgment, but to show mercy instead. And therefore, mercy will win. You guys getting this? One of the, so here's what I'm saying then. One of the primary ways that we love and serve God, this is really simple, is by loving and serving others. I mean, right? And, we, and when we do that, it's a tangible, powerful way of showing God's goodness to the world around us. It really is. It's not just that we get emotional health and spiritual blessings and whatever, we have peace and all of that, but it's a real effect on people around us, mercy and forgiveness. It really is. And this is why Jesus highlights the golden rule. Basically, loving your neighbor as you love yourself is like fulfilling all of the law. You get that down and you give yourself pouring out your life to love and serve God by loving and serving others. You just took care of the law and the prophets, my friend. That's all what that was trying to point you to. The law and the prophets are trying to point you to the first and greatest commandment. If you'll do that, the rest will follow. It's like I said before, I wrote it down like this. It's quite difficult to disobey God when you are consumed with and walking in his love. The love that he has for you and the love that he has for other people. And that's good. I want to make it as difficult as possible for my not-headedness to come through, right? So now let's back up to Matthew chapter 5. I want to show you this because I saved this one for last as far as the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6 and 7, 5, 6 and 7, because it's super powerful. So let's read starting in verse 38, Matthew chapter 5. Look at this. You've heard that it was said, eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not show opposition against an evil person. But whoever slaps you on your right cheek Turn the other toward him also. And then he goes on about if someone wants your tunic, give him your cloak also, all these other examples. Skip down to verse 43. You have heard it said, heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Now listen to this. Why am I asking you to do something that's near impossible? But it's not impossible if he's giving us the command to do it. That means he's going to empower us to do it, right? But it is impossible in our own strength, in our own flesh, for sure. God's mercy is, is heaven. It's a heavenly thing. It's a spiritual thing. He says this in 45, So that I want you to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may prove yourselves to be sons of your Father who is in heaven. Wow. What a huge line that is. This is how the evidence comes forth that you belong to me. This is how you show everybody else... You put the Father's heart on display when you do this. When you love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That's the manifestation of the Heavenly Father's heart on the earth through you as a son and a daughter. You just proved who your Father is. That you're becoming more and more like Him. That you're following Him, right? That something, a transaction has taken place in your life that has transformed you to the point that you're actually loving people that don't love you back. And have nothing to offer you. Nothing to give. No benefit from it at all. That's only the love of God. That's only the Spirit of God that can produce that mercy and grace in us. 
Huge point. And it goes on, for he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Now here it is. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Even the tax collectors, uh-oh, do they not do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Even the Gentiles, do they not do the same? Once again, he's saying, this is something that should set you apart. This is a distinctive in you. Right? It's different than the rest of the world. It's how they'll know that this is the truth. This is true love, true joy, true peace, true mercy, true grace. Verse 48, therefore, here's a really hard statement here. Therefore, you shall be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, your translation may say, uh, therefore, be merciful as your heavenly Father is merciful, or be compassionate as your heavenly Father is compassionate. And it may say that, actually, I think in Luke, it, it, it phrases it that way. So think about that. Perfect, we're to be perfect as the heavenly Father is perfect. But what that word actually means is it means to be mature. And what does the Bible say in 1 John? That we're supposed to be perfected in love. There's a process of love being perfected in us. Did you know that? That's what this whole Christian journey is about. Learning to walk in love. That love would be perfected and be manifest in us and through us. So he's saying, I want you to be perfect. I want you to grow up and mature to have complete Compassion, complete mercy. And that's what God's love is about. When you, when you look at the word mercy and you try to define it, and even the word that, that word that I just used, loving kindness, it's not, that's not a real word, actually. They had to, to put this compound thing together to create this idea of God's love and kindness. It's, it's forgiveness is wrapped up into that. It's mercy and grace. So they had to make up a word, essentially. The psalmists that use this word over and over and over again, God's loving kindness. It wasn't in the natural language, but it was of God. <laughs> He's like, I want you to display my loving kindness, which is forgiveness wrapped up in mercy and grace. That type of compassion, loving kindness is what you're to walk in. So here's the thing as Christians, right? We're not allowed to have enemies. We have an enemy. The Bible describes him quite, quite plainly, right? The devil, Satan, the father of lies, the accuser of the brethren. He's the, the enemy that we have. That's it. There may be people in our lives who consider and treat us as enemies, but we don't think or act in the same way towards them. That's the thing. And even if they've actively and unjustifiably attacked us in some way, we're told not to take matters into our own hands. So, look, because the Bible says that vengeance belongs to who? Vengeance belongs to the Lord. Justice belongs to the Lord. And that's good news because he's our defender, right? We don't have to defend ourselves. We don't have to get in a tizzy and try to whatever. God's quite capable of defending us, and not just defending us, but actually bringing good out of evil, actually, because he's not just a defender, he's a redeemer. Hello. Here's what our part is, according to what Jesus just said. Our part is to get out of the way. And invite the Holy Spirit into the situation by loving and praying for those who have wronged us. That's it. We need to get our janked up self out of the way. And just love and pray. Let the Holy Spirit come into the situation. Because that's the only way they're going to have eyes to see. That's the only way they're going to have conviction. That's the only way they're going to be softened in any kind of way. It's through the Holy Spirit's work. We have to be those vessels. Here's the thing. The great thing when we do this is that, as I said before, the Father's heart is revealed in us when we do this. We put Him on display for others to see and experience. It's the evidence that we're different, and we do indeed belong to Him and are becoming more and more like Him. Does anybody want to be like Jesus? Is anybody there yet? <laughs> are you perfect as the Heavenly Father is perfect? No, but we're going for it, right? I've been forgiven much, so I'm going to love much. It's worth it to lay down my life to go the low road. It really is. Did Jesus come in, you know, as a as a as a king and as a great whatever? No, he came in as a humble, impoverished carpenter's son. 
Now make no mistake, because he, he went to that low place, the Bible says he's going to be exalted to the highest place. And he says, if we will do that, if we'll humble ourselves over and over and over again and show mercy and forgive people, then guess what? In due time, we will also be exalted. I'm telling you, man, the Bible is real. This stuff is, this, this, this is where the rubber meets the road. This reveals where our hearts are at. It does. And I thank God for his word. I thank God for his mercy. I thank God that we can see through Israel how often they tripped up and stumbled and got to worship and idols. And he called them back every time. He forgave them and had mercy on them every time. Thank you, Lord. If you do that with Israel, you can do that with us. God's actually calling us to be merciful as he is merciful. He really is. It's, it's real. It's, it's attainable. It's not some high and lofty thing that we can never ever do. No, we can. And when we do, it's glorious. Okay, let me show you how glorious it really is. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 24. I referenced this scripture earlier, but I want to show it to you. And I want, to, I want you to notice how often the word many is used in this scripture. Matthew 24, we're going to skip down to verse 9. This is Jesus talking about the end of the age. His disciples asked the question, how are we going to know? When is the sign of your coming? In verse 9 he says, Then they will hand you over to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations because of my name. And at that time, many, everybody say many, there it is. Notice how many times this comes into play. And at that time, many will fall away. Listen, and they will betray one another and hate one another. And here's what I'm trying to tell you. This is the context that Jesus is going to return to, where Satan is doing everything he can to cause people to give the anger and bitterness and hatred and division. And yet there's going to be a counterculture rise up in the midst of that. In the midst of that kind of crazy darkness and chaos, there's going to be a bride of Christ that's going to be laid down lovers for him. <sighs> there's going to be a remnant. There's going to be many that are going to fall, many that will betray and hate, but there's going to be a remnant that's going to rise up all over the earth. Verse 11, many false prophets will rise up and mislead many people. How many people are on the planet right now? Like 8 billion people? It's a lot of people. Billions, billions of people are on the line, for real. They need to see something, don't they? They need to see something different than what the world has to offer. Verse 12, and because lawlessness is increased, here it is, most people's love will become cold. What did Jesus say about lukewarmness, right? It's like you can't afford to let your love go that way. Not in this hour, because it's going to be freezing cold. Someone's going to have to have a burning passion, a zeal, right? Like the Lord is going to wrap himself in a cloak of zeal, it says, from one of the prophets. I'm telling you, it's the time for that to happen. We're in that, that hour. Verse 13, but the one who endures to the end. Now this is interesting. Because he's talking in the context of one who can endure all the pressure, all the persecution, all the hatred and betrayal. The person that can endure and continue to forgive and love and show mercy and have grace. That's the one that he's talking about. That's one that's a true son of the Father. That's one who really has inherited salvation. That's one who's been forgiven and is loving because of it. You see what I'm saying? Now it starts to make sense, some of these scriptures. And what is the last one here in verse 14? This gospel of the kingdom. It's a kingdom of warriors that are willing to love and to lay down their lives, to fight for love, to continue, to press in, past the offense, and past the potential you know, bitterness and all the things that can rise up in us. We're saying, no, the gospel of the kingdom is mercy and grace and forgiveness and love. Passion. This is who our God is. He's a coming king and a coming judge. And so we're going to let mercy triumph over judgment. That's what the gospel of the kingdom is about. 
We're making a highway by laying down our lives. We're, we're walking in humility before the Lord. This is the gospel of the kingdom. The inside out, upside down kingdom, right? The gospel of the kingdom. What is our king like? How do we display? How do we serve him? That's what we're talking about. It's not a, it's not a weird, mysterious thing. It's actually where it, it's, it's made and played to fulfill all the law and prophets. We just treat other people how we want to be treated, right? We've been shown mercy, so we show mercy. I mean, it's just the, it's just the outflow. It should be the natural consequence of our relationship with Jesus. So here's what I'm saying with all of this. We've got to understand. We've got to wake up. We have to be aware. There's going to be these two extreme social and, and really it's linked spiritually. Social and spiritual developments that are going to occur simultaneously in the global body of Christ in the end times. And once again, Jesus is talking to, now he's not talking to the world here. He's talking to his disciples. He's talking, this is going to happen even within the church. There's going to be a culture of betrayal and in contrast, a culture of deep love and unity. That's what's going to happen. John 17, Jesus' prayer. We're going to be able to answer that prayer. <laughs> Through his spirit, by his grace, we're going to become one. That was his prayer. It's going to happen even in the midst of Satan doing his worst to try to divide us. Isn't that amazing that God's created the storyline to rise up in front of everybody? It's going to be amazing. Absolutely. He's a genius. I'm so glad that he's the king. I'm so glad that I know him and I'm his son. He's, I, it's, just, it's just unreal. And sometimes I'm like, man, it's hard to convey these truths. It's hard in some sense to get people to, 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 to for this to grip people, for them to get it. But it's going to happen. The Holy Spirit's going to pour out and there's going to be real manifestations of God's power. It's going to happen. And it's going to be through us, weak and broken people, that are going to reveal the Father's heart. And it's not going to be because we're doing miracles. and we're, It's because we're showing mercy and forgiving people. <laughs> That's the way Jesus chose it. You would think, let's go out with our guns and ammo and let's feed the... the, the. Right? We have another strategy, another plan. He's like, no, show mercy and forgive people that don't deserve it. Okay, God, I, you're bigger than me. You're greater than me, so I'll go with that. But we can actually do that, can't we? We can actually do that. You know, it's funny. Oh, I, uh, one of my favorite shows uh, is The Twilight Zone. I'm talking about the old school Rod Serling. It's classic stuff, man. I mean, you can learn so many lessons through watching that show. But he had this one episode that I watched recently. Where it's like these, these guys are super advanced. There, there was this guy that came and he created all these formulas where you can basically, and he was so ahead of his time, where you could basically 3D print stuff. I mean, think about it. This was back in the, when it, what was the Twilight Zone? 50s or something? It's black and white. It's all right. But you, he came up with this formula to create this machine that could 3D print stuff and basically come up with cures and, you know, all this. You could heal diseases and feed people and everything else. And they kept it secret because they were like, the world cannot handle this. And the guy that created this told us, don't let this get out of this community. The world's not ready for it yet. So they were charged with this sacred commission to keep this safe and secret. And this guy happens to come into this town, and he starts to see all this weird stuff going on. He's like, what's happening here? My dog got ran over, and now he came back to life. Like weird stuff like that. They were able to have this little device. You know, and all of a sudden, you know, the Twilight Zone have these weird sound effects. You know? <laughs> and so he's like, what's happening? And he finally, he won't let it go. They're trying to get him to leave the town. He's like, no, I want to know what's something weird's going on here. I'm not leaving. So they finally have to try to explain to him. And it's like, so listen, you, you have to assimilate. You, you can never leave. Either it's you stay here or we have to execute you. Like you can't go and share this with anybody. He's like, man, y'all are crazy. Y'all can help the world. I can't believe y'all are keeping this, blah, 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 blah. So he's all mad. He's like, I, I just want to be free. I don't, so they put him in this house. And it's got this invisible barrier around it. Anyway, there's this girl that's there. You know, it's always the girl. It's always the downfall. And so the girl comes <laughs> into the picture. It's like, hey, I'm going to help you. And I'm in love with you. And this and that. And he's like, okay. 
Dummy. But, uh, he, so he goes with her, and he's like, all right, you stay here at the car. I'm going to go down to the room. I'm going to get the formula and whatever it is. But instead of just getting the book, he goes, and he looks in the file folders. And what do you think the first thing he, he creates with the 3D printer is? A gun. I'm going to print a gun. It's the first thing that I'm going to do. And he just proves their point. They come in the road. He thinks he's getting away. He gets the book and everything. And they get down the road. And then she's like, open the book. And he opens the book and it's completely blank. <laughs> and then she, he realizes that she was in on it. And they bring him back in. And he's like, look what, well, well, look what you did. You think the world, you, the first thing you did was print a gun. We can't let this get out. You just showed us what's in the human heart. This is what mankind will do. The tendency is toward violence and death and destruction. Anyway, watch the Twilight Zone. We'll teach you about life. <laughs> but that's, that's our first inclination is to try to dominate and get an advantage over people. To have the power to have weaponry so people will submit. And whatever form that takes. Oh, man. Come on, somebody. But let me say this, that even this... This betrayal that's going to happen, this hatred, and even martyrdom is going to happen. This betrayal in blood, we'll say. These are actually accelerants. In other words, it's actually going to accelerate things. That can be good or bad. It's either going to accelerate our desire to get before the feet of Jesus and to humble ourselves and say, I need you, God. Help me to forgive. Help me to show mercy. Or it'll cause us to go more into offense and more in bitterness. Quicker, either direction. That's what these things are designed to do, to reveal what's in the human heart, and you're going to go down one road or the other. There's no in-between. You hear what I'm saying? It's creating an urgency in us to go deeper in God so that we can find understanding, reconciliation, healing, and peace for the pain. Because there's going to be pain. It's one of the most painful things you can experience is when a friend betrays you. Somebody you thought loved you. Somebody you thought you could trust. And then they turn their back on you. One of the most painful things the human heart can experience. We're going to need God's grace and mercy like never before in the hour that's coming. But God wants us to model something totally different. If that's going to be the spirit of the Antichrist and what Satan's doing, we have to operate in the opposite spirit, don't we? And it's going, to take, it's going to take work. It's going, to, it's going to take us flexing some spiritual muscles. Every time we want to argue with God about that person and us wanting to do X, Y, Z, God's going to say, hey, remember when I showed you mercy when you were doing that same thing? Mm -hmm. ah, did you really have to bring that up? I, and all of a sudden, you've got to do a spiritual push-up. All right, there, there it is. And then another situation comes up. God's like, hey, remember when you were doing that? Remember how I dealt with you? Ah, oh, okay, another push-up. Get down. Get down and give me 20, son. That's what's going to be happening. But we've got to do the spiritual push-ups, right? So that we grow in this. So here's the thing. I want to say this last thing here. So the enemy's tactics, we know. They're the three Ds here. The enemy's tactics are deception, division, and distraction. And they all come in a spirit of accusation. Think about that. Deception, division, distraction, all in a spirit of accusation. Now I want to say that, that we know that one of Satan's names is that he's the father of lies, but he's also the accuser of the brethren. And he uses lies and he uses half-truths to accuse us, right? So really he's using lies to create accusation. The deception is huge, but he uses the deception to create accusation, both against God and against other people. That's what he does. That's how he's going to divide people. We start playing the blame game, and all of a sudden the gap gets wider and wider. Think about it. I'm telling you, he knows what the Father, what Jesus and the Father want. They want us to be one. Satan's going to gather all his might and sling all his fiery arrows of accusation at Israel. How many of you know arrows of accusation are going up against Israel, even in our own nation? And that's really sad, really heartbreaking. And it's people being ignorant and deceived is what they are. And I just tell them like it is. They don't know that Israel's historic and spiritual right to that land. They don't know. 
That doesn't belong to the UN. That doesn't belong to anybody. That belongs to God. God gave that to them, period. And if you decide to strip that away from them, you're going to see the hand of God come and defend them. So what I'm saying is, Israel has experienced the most accusation of any people group on the earth. The most hatred, the most betrayal, the most persecution. And we're called to stand with them. Think about that. We're grafted in, and it's glorious. The promises we're grafted into, we're grafted into persecution. Nobody wants to think about that. I'll take the promises and leave out the persecution. I'm sorry. It's both and. It's not either or. But when we do that, once again, what are we supposed to be doing? Provoking Israel to jealousy. How do we do that? By loving them with a supernatural love and grace and mercy. Even when the rest of the world is accusing them. We say, no, we love them. You hear what I'm saying? God's setting up the context. He's going to do it. He's going to throw these arrows of accusation at Israel and the body of Christ to keep us from becoming who we're meant to become, which is one new man with Christ as the head and us, Jew and Gentile, as the body. That's what he wants, ultimately. Satan wants to dismantle the body through fear, through offense, through bitterness and hatred that all lead to betrayal. But it's in this context, I'm saying it again, of Satan's rage and amidst this great pressure and persecution that love and mercy will be magnified and exemplified in a supernatural way. That's what we need. In the midst of pressure and persecution, what's the answer to that? It's for love and mercy to be magnified and exemplified. Exemplified means you're an example of it. You're living it. So people can taste and see that God is good. This is how, we're, this is how we overcome. How do we overcome? We know what the scripture says in Revelation. What does it say? By the blood of the, and the word of our... What's our testimony? Is our testimony, yeah, back in 1987, I went to the front and I received Jesus as my Lord. I mean, that's great. You, you, you went to the front, you had an experience, you, you got saved. But is that your testimony? Your testimony is how you laid down your life and continue to forgive and show mercy. And that's what your testimony is. That Jesus changed me, so I laid down my life the way that he did for other people. That's what your testimony should be. How can I be? God blessed me. Now, how can I be a blessing? My testimony is that I did not love my life even unto death. That's what he says about the martyrs. That's the testimony he's talking about. That's what will spread the gospel of the kingdom. We did not give up, right? We endured to the end. And what we all we did was, all we did was, we loved how he loved us. That's it. And it's enough. It's enough for us to just love the way that he loved. That's it. It's going to be enough. But do we really believe that? That's the thing. We really understand the deeper thing that's going on, the bigger picture of God. And I'm going to, well, in the next few weeks, break down some certain things that will help us, I think, grab a hold <laughs> with, a, like we've been talking about, with urgency and sobriety. And that we'll be able to use as a tool to tell other people, here's what's really going on. Here's what's at the root. Here's the biblical foundations. We don't have to necessarily tell them that it's from the Bible. Eventually, when we start telling this stuff and it starts happening before it happens, where, where are you getting this information? Eventually, they're going to be like, what's happening here? And you'll be able to be like, well, it's the Bible and the Holy Spirit. You should try it. You should really check it out. You see what I'm saying? It'll stir a curiosity. Because everybody right now is talking about the war in Israel. All eyes are on that. It's a global thing that's happening. It could spread further and there'd be widespread consequences because of that. So people are trying to figure out what's going on. And that's actually to our advantage, not our disadvantage. There's a holy curiosity. The thing is, who's going to satisfy that curiosity? It's got to be us. And it can't just be with words. It's got to be indeed with mercy and forgiveness. Amen? Amen? Let's stand.
So one of the one of the reasons that I'll, I wanted to share this with you, I'm just going to play a video. Now Daniel's about to come out. Sorry, Daniel. I'm going to want to play a video of, a, of an old Matt Redman song called Mercy. It's a great song. And if you could just get a little revelation of what's in this song. <laughs> but the reason I'm sharing that, because it's like, that's, that's kind of a weird message that you're preaching this, you know. But that my whole thing is that accusation and betrayal is going to run rampant. What's happening with Israel We've got to position ourselves in a particular way. It's, 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 we're saying that we want discernment and we want strategy. And I'm telling you, this is part of the strategy from heaven. This is part of the heart of God that we're to walk in. So I'm, I'm saying that this is relevant to us as a church, personally, but it has global implications and ramifications. I'm saying that what God is doing with Israel and through Israel is that he wants to make his name great through mercy, through forgiveness, through love, that there would be hope, even in the hopelessness, that there would be an anchor for our soul, that there would be something manifest in the earth that's of a supernatural nature that has to be from above, has to be heavenly. That's what's happening. And we're a part of the story. We're not just passively watching and observing. No, we're involved for real. We just have to recognize that we're involved and let God use us accordingly. Are you, are you connecting the dots with me? You see what I'm saying? It's not, a, it's not a small thing, what's going on in the earth right now. Lord, we thank you. Father, here we are. Make us trophies of your grace and of your mercy. God, fill us with your love. There's another place in Ephesians where it says that if we would know the depth of his love, the height, the width, and the breadth, that we would be filled to the fullness of God. It's when we know his love, when we enter into love, that we're filled with the fullness of God, it says. And God, we want the fullness. We want to be perfect as you are perfect. We want to be merciful and compassionate as you are. We want to put you on display. We want to magnify you. So here's what I'm going to, I'm believing what's going to happen in this room as we listen to this song, as we worship together, as we lift up our eyes and our hearts to the God of mercy, I believe unforgiveness and offense and bitterness is just going to fall off. I believe that the person or the people that have hurt you, the things that have just been locking you up emotionally and everything else, that God's going to deal with that in this moment. I really do. That's what my prayer was in preaching this message. That, that, that betrayal and that hurt and that pain, that it would be resolved in a moment as Jesus pours out his mercy and forgiveness and love. That you would receive it for yourself and then release it to that other person. Oh, Father, have your way in this moment. Oh, Jesus, come, come. Make us more like you. Make us more like you. We want to judge rightly. We want to, we want to judge with a spirit of mercy on us. Take away the pride. Take away the condescension. Take away anything, Father, that's not of you. Shift our lens. Shift our view. Shift our thinking. In this place, as we worship you, let your anointing come and break the yoke of bondage, of unforgiveness, of anger, of hatred, of the betrayal. And fill us to fullness with your love and compassion. That you would burn it away. God, your eyes of fire would pierce to the depths of our soul. That we would not hide from it. But that we would be fully exposed and surrender to you. And say, God, I don't want this hurt. I don't want this anger. I don't want this burden anymore. I can't fix it. I can't carry it. I give it to you. Let that happen in the hearts of your people today. Healing. Let inner healing come. Let freedom come in our emotions. Let freedom come in our thoughts. Walls come down. Strongholds come down in the name of Jesus. The enemy will not grip you with that anymore. We thank you, God, that as we're forgiven much, we love much, Father. We can do this. You commanded and mandated that we do it, and so you will empower us to do it. With man, it's impossible, but with God, all things are possible, even to endure to the end in the midst of pressure and persecution.